Wow, amazing. Um, it's hard to follow things like that. Um, okay, so we're shifting gears. We've had a kind of science perspective. By the way, I talk loudly, so if I'm deafening you, I might turn the microphone off. But, um, shifting gears, uh, we've had some kind of science approach. Uh, this session is really more about thinking how we can translate that into practice in the classroom. And um, I've been asked to talk for about 10 minutes about a project that uh, we're running right now, which has done exactly that. So I'm going to take you through a very speedy journey from some basic science to how you deliver something that is usable, in, in, that is evidence-based and usable in the classroom. And unfortunately, I won't go all the way to the end because we're in the middle of an evaluation of whether this works or not. So fingers crossed, um, it will work the way we think. We have, like a lot of these big projects, we have some initial studies, such as the ones that uh, Daphne described, uh, where we've gone into some classes to uh, make sure that the processes we believed were at play were actually working. Um, but what we're doing here is scaling this up and seeing if you release these kind of programs out in the wild to teachers across the country who have no um, necessarily involvement or implication uh, in the project, uh, will they still use it in the right way and it, will it uh, deliver uh, in the, the kind of ends that we think it will? Okay, so very quickly, um, I'm going to talk about uh, reasoning uh, in math and science and a, a really speedy trip through the kind of neuroscience literature of this. Uh, when we're talking about neuroscience, people are very interested in, in what might be happening in the brain when we engage in tasks, slightly more complicated tasks, problem solving tasks and reasoning tasks uh, that underlie lots of different domains, particularly uh, math and science. There are many different ways to try and get at what's going on in the brain. Of course, uh, because we're dealing with real people, we can't cut open their brain and look at it you know, while they're involved in it, so we have to use indirect measures. The kinds of indirect measures that we rely on uh, a lot are uh, things like magnetic resonance imaging, and just so you know, there's two different types. On the right, you've got structural imaging, which is really just looking at the anatomy. What are the bits of the brain? What size are they? How are they connected to, e to each other? On the left side here, we have what's called functional magnetic uh, resonance imaging, and this is trying to get a grip on what parts of the brain are working or doing something when you're engaged in a particular task. But in order to do that, we only have indirect measures. So functional magnetic uh, resonance imaging is really just measuring changes in blood flow in those parts of the brain. And the idea is that the bits of the brain that have more blood flowing through them, that are being oxygenated more, are the ones that are working hard at the moment. But that's quite an indirect link, so you have to keep that in mind um, about the kind of un un assumptions that underlie this, this work, this basic science. In terms of exploring reasoning uh, what's happening in the brain during reasoning, most of the work has been done with adults, university students, because they're cheap and they're free. Uh, they, they love to come along, and, and adolescents as well. There's very little work on younger children because there are some technical difficulties of using these sorts of methods with younger children. In particular, you have to stay still. And these sessions often last up to half an hour. I mean, we can kind of block them, so they've got to be absolutely still for five minutes. But um, anyone who's worked with a four-year-old knows that that is very hard. Um, you, uh, interestingly, they can do this sort of stuff with babies, very young babies, when they're asleep. Um, but there's this kind of dark area from about two to six years of age, where it's really difficult to get any data. So we're extrapolating towards the younger age based on adult um, data. Um, what are the key findings from this neuroscience, neuroimaging literature? Um, the key finding is that all aspects of, of reasoning, the kind of reasoning, uh, causal reasoning, deductive reasoning, uh, in inductive reasoning, and so forth, involve the recruitment of executive functions. The executive functions is really controlling uh, the, how the different parts of our cognitions, of our minds, uh, come together. Uh, and two types of executive functions that are essential for reasoning are evaluative and control functions. Um, the evaluative ones, which are subsumed by, uh, so there's two areas that light up a lot, as it were, um, in these reasoning tasks. One is the anterior cingulate, and this is a, 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 a region of the brain that's involved or that gets activated when we detect that something's inconsistent, something's wrong, something doesn't go with our predictions. So this comes up when there's an inconsistency between what we believe and uh, with the information we're, we're currently being presented with. And another part is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is involved in tasks that involve relating things, so relational information, and also integrating knowledge across different um, bases. So really what happens in reasoning tasks, especially when you're faced with new information, is that um, the AC goes, hey, wait a minute, this isn't what I believed, and then the DL 
I can never say that, DLPFC uh, kind of tries to resolve the problem. Um, I've sometimes described this as the kind of Batman and Robin of, of reasoning, where the AC is Robin going, hey, there's a problem, and Batman is the uh, DLPFC kind of solving the problem. Um, so this is just a general, very broad brush overview of a, quite a few studies on reasoning, again, in the adult and adolescent brain. A few years ago, an important paper came out in terms of uh, understanding what is involved in taking on counterintuitive uh, novel concepts. So part of learning, particularly in science, involves overcoming naive concepts that we've acquired through everyday experience, um, but which are wrong. So uh, my classic example of this is when you're trying to teach kind of a seven-year-old that uh, the Earth is round, they have about five years of experience of walking on what appears to be a flat Earth, right? So you have to kind of overcome this in order to take on the, the new knowledge. And of course, this is true at all ages. It's even true um, across history. Um, in terms of the history of science, people had to really learn to ignore really deeply entrenched prior beliefs in order to take on new um, theories. And this um, group from Montreal did a study comparing reasoning abilities of expert scientists, in this case third year, final year physics undergraduates, versus uh, similar novices. Uh, I think they were uh, English, actually it was French, French uh, undergraduates as well. Um, and they found that um, they gave them reasoning tasks, some of which are consistent with our beliefs, but some of which the actual answer went against your first uh, naive um, belief. And what they found is the big difference between the uh, experts and the non-experts is not that the experts didn't still have these naive beliefs, but that the experts were better at inhibiting them and therefore allowing the higher level, uh, perhaps more formally trained uh, concepts to come to the forefront. So a key conclusion here was what allowed expertise to emerge is this ability to inhibit your prior beliefs. And this is the key idea on which we developed a kind of learning activity uh, to go into the schools, which to foreshadow what's coming next, uh, is involved in trying to train children to use their uh, inhibitory control skills better in the context of math and science. To stop for a minute, don't go with that first thing that's jump popping into your mind, take a break and allow the kind of more reflective um, mode uh, to engage. Um, so <coughs> just the, the background of this intervention I'm going to talk about um, uh, is based on, on these kind of key features. First, that science and math learning in, requires inhibiting prior beliefs, and in, in the case of geometry, sometimes direct perceptual um, solutions. Um, inhibitory control, which we're trying to get people to use better, uh, is, is a key factor in devel cognitive development anyway, um, and is something that is uh, more impaired, let's say, in lower SES children. So any kind of training along these dimensions are likely to benefit children from difficult backgrounds more than um, those that are not in difficult backgrounds. Another key idea here um, is that, um, as was mentioned by Daphne as well, there is some evidence that training these executive functions inhibitory control uh, can transfer to other tasks, but that evidence is mitigated. Really, what's best is to, trans to train this within the context of the domain you're interested in. So we want to embed these tasks that will train uh, inhibition within the math and science curriculum that we're interested <laughs> in the children learning. Um, okay, so uh, this project uh, is, is going at the moment. Uh, there are many more details available on our website. Uh, if, I want, if I want to give the IT support people a heart attack, I'll try to click on the web page and see if it works. I'll keep that for the end. But um, do have a look if you're interested because we are actually recruiting schools <laughs> to this trial. So this is something you might be interested in. Please come and see us. And it's a project that's funded by the Wellcome Trust and the um, Education Endowment Foundation. Uh, the Unlock project actually unrolls in uh, three phases. We're right uh, towards the end of phase one, and phase one was really um, a development phase to try to identify in practice what is the most optimal way of delivering this kind of training um, in the classroom. Um, so to paraphrase, what we're trying to do is to train kids to stop and think in math and science before responding. In order to deliver that, we've, we've, um, we've decided to go with an IT base, uh, for lots of practical reasons, but the IT aspect of it is not a fundamental assumption of, of what we're doing. It could be uh, delivered in other ways. Um, and for a lot of theoretical reasons, uh, it, it would be best if we could deliver this uh, on an individual basis, one child, one computer, um, because then we can tailor the training to the needs of the individual, uh, to the level of the individual, uh, to keep them engaged. Um, in practice, that's not always possible in the schools, because not all schools have individual 
computers that work. Um, so we're comparing, in this pilot phase, we're comparing the feasibility of using individualized mode versus a whole classroom-based thing where the, the, the teacher would be standing in front of the classroom with a whiteboard and they would step through it uh, each time. This is likely to lead to a lower effect, but on the other hand, might actually, in practice, be more deliverable. Um, so we're just towards the end of that, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the second phase is delivering the, the large-scale intervention across the country, and then there's a third phase where we will go back and speak to the teachers and the educators and get feedback on their experience and how it can, the, uh, the, the uh, IT uh, game can be improved and so forth. Um, so <coughs> we are targeting primary school kids. Uh, this is targeting year three and year five children. Uh, the large intervention will target 100 schools, 6,000 children. Uh, what it actually involves is playing this game that I will show you, this learning activity that I will show you, 12 minutes at the beginning of three math or science lessons uh, a week, maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, as part of that normal lesson. So it's not additional teaching the material, it's replacing 10 minutes or 12 minutes of the lesson with this kind of training activity. Um, the, the training activity is embedded entirely within the curriculum of those years, um, so they are still getting uh, an equivalent amount of exposure to the knowledge of the, uh, of, of the domains for those particular years. We also have in this, uh, in this intervention uh, control groups, uh, control, uh, control conditions. So why do we need a control condition? We need a control condition just to make sure that the kids who have played our games aren't getting better because the game is more fun. Um, or because they know they're in a study, so the teachers are working harder and the kids are working harder. Okay, this is what's called the Hawthorne effect. If you know you're in a study, you perform better. Um, so you might say, why don't we just pretend, tell people they're in a study, and then they'll do better. But anyway, it doesn't last very long. That's the problem. Okay, I have to wrap up. Um, so there's a control group where, where kids are playing the same sort of video game, uh, getting social skills training. Um, so very quickly, some examples of, of, of things. What do we mean by this? Um, these are not from the year three and five curricula, but they're examples of things we've t uh, talked about for other curricula. Um, just, um, if you're asked questions like, you know, are elephants bigger, smaller, the, uh, elephant cells bigger, smaller, or the same size as mouse cells, everyone wants to say bigger, but no, they're not, <laughs> they're the same size. Um, or things like, you know, when a candle melts, does the resulting wax weigh more or less or the same as before? It weighs the same, even though there's been a change of state. Uh, Math type of misconceptions are, are things like if you have arcs like up here, um, you know, is the, does the red arc bend more or less or the same as the clear arc? Um, well, actually, they bend the same amount. <laughs> it's just that one line is longer than the other. Um, you know, is two thirds more or less uh, or the same as four six? Uh, lots of children want to say four six is more because the numbers are bigger, but actually they're they're equal. Um, so here's the bit where I make the. This might be very short, <laughs> uh, or not. This is the bit where I make the. Uh, IT people go crazy. Um, so what I want to do is just show you a little demo, if I can, maybe two or three minutes, sorry, <laughs> of what this thing looks like. So all these principles are embedded within a game that they'll play for 12 minutes. The game is actually in the structure of a, of a, of a video game, if it works. Let me show you this. Uh, there we are. Um, and there are three phases to it. Um, so this is, this is just a screen capture of someone, some child actually playing this game, right? So I have no control over this. Um, so they have to click the buttons. They'll move on. Uh, in fact, I could. Hello, I'm Andy. So Let's meet our contestants. My name is Candice. My name is Ollie. My name's Kate. Let's continue. Here is a new question. Remember to stop and think about your answer. So that's the key thing that what we're trying to get them is shown by the block. And while this red thing is happening, they can't actually respond to inhibit them from, from clicking or playing with it immediately. Um. So they've got this five second delay. I hope you all know the answer, by the way. <laughs> I don't know. So we're, we're, we're stopping. <laughs> that's the whole point. <coughs> Okay, so then they have to type in the number. They actually answer it themselves. There's the, the child typing in 43. I, I won't go on for much longer. That is the correct answer. Right. So, so then there's a phase. Let's okay, see I'll what the other contestants thought. Right, so I'll, I'll stop there. So, so there's, then there's a phase where they get each of the contestants provides hypothetical um, alternative um, 
you know, answers, they have to make a decision about which was right, again, they have to stop and wait, and then they enter what we call a, a bonus phase, where they then do a series of problems based on that um, concept that we were exploring. Um, uh, yeah, and, and that's just one of the maths. We have about 100 uh, different uh, problem sets like this involved in, in the game. Okay, so final, final slide. What were some of the challenges? So we're in the middle of the pilot stage now. Um, uh, what we found is, is uh, whether the schools have sufficient IT resources. So they will say they do, but when you get there, they only have you know, 23 rather than 28 uh, com computers and there are 28 in the class. And of the 23, only 21 of them actually work. Um, so that's, these are issues that we, we need to think about. Um, fitting it into the timetable, clearly, you know, um, uh, in primary school, maths, uh, <laughs> anyway, there's a lot to fit in, so adding this in is something that, that the teachers are not always uh, happy with, fitting it into the lesson plan. It's constructed so it doesn't, uh, the teachers don't have to build a lesson plan around it, it gets played at the beginning, and then they carry on with a lesson which was 15 minutes uh, shorter. Um, one problem we've had, uh, particularly with the younger group, is uh, because it includes the material that's in the curriculum for that year, depending on when you play the game at the beginning or at the end of the year, the children either have or haven't seen that material beforehand. So that's an issue that, that teachers have brought up to us. Um, and then, of course, the consistency of usage. I mean, we're, the teachers are all busy. Um, and sometimes, sometimes they like these games because it fills time, but other times uh, they just drop it because, um, yeah, there are other things to do. Um, so we've had a very, in the pilot so far, we had a very mixed uh, bag of responses. We've had some absolutely excellent responses with teachers saying this is lovely. The kids, uh, particularly the year three kids, really like this. Um, we've had some less great ones uh, where they, the, some of the teachers are, are feeling um, and there's so much time pressure on them anyway that they don't want to build this. Anyway, I put these challenges up here because they're supposed to be some of the basis of your discussions. That's it. I've overrun my time. Um, thank you.